Today we continue to send our love to the great people of New York and New Jersey. We support them fully. We grieve alongside every family who has lost a precious loved one. New Yorkers are tough and strong and brave. New Jerseyites are tough and strong and brave, and they're being hit very hard right now. And for the next week, hopefully not much longer than that, it's going to start to go in the other direction. Our country is being hit hard, but some areas have done so incredibly well. We're so proud of them. Uh, they will beat this virus. We're going to beat it with the grit and the heart for which they're known and for which our country is known. And uh, we appreciate everything that everybody is doing. We also — we pray for Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He's become a great friend of ours. He loves this country. He loves his country. But he loves the USA, and he's always been very good to us. Whenever we had difficulty, he was with us, and we appreciate it. So we pray for Prime Minister Boris Johnson. It's going through a lot. As we intensify our military campaign against the virus, I think that uh, it must be brought out that we have to thank the American people for continuing to follow our guidelines on slowing the spread an expression that more and more people are thinking about. Nobody ever heard of it two months ago, and now everybody is talking about slowing the spread, stopping the spread. Even during this painful week, we see glimmers of uh, very, very strong hope. And uh, this will be a very painful week. And next week, at least part of next week, but probably uh, all of it. Look, if one person dies, it's a painful week. And we know that's going to, unfortunately, happen. This is a monster we're fighting. But signs are that our strategy is totally working. Every American has a role to play in winning this war. And we're going to be winning it. We're going to be winning it powerfully. And we'll be prepared for the next one, should it happen. But hopefully, it won't. Our massive airlift operation for critical supplies — it's called Project Airbridge — continued today as five Massive planes, flights, landed in the United States, packed with personal protective equipment. And our nation's heroic health care workers uh, will be the beneficiaries of that. Twenty-seven more flights are scheduled in the near future over the next couple of weeks. The Army Corps of Engineers is constructing facilities that will support more than 15,000 hospital beds to treat patients in need. So they're building now approximately 15,000. They just completed the big one in New York. They just completed and are in the process of continuing in Chicago and many other places. They're incredible. The Army Corps of Engineers, we owe them a lot, what they were able to do in such a short period of time. They'll build these massive facilities, 2,000 beds in four days. So it's really something very special. I know I was in the construction industry, and you don't see that happen very often. I want to remind governors and emergency managers that sharing real-time data with us about equipment and their needs is very important. All of their supplies, hospital occupancy is critical. A lot of the occupancy is uh, really getting a little bit lower than anticipated, and that's good. We sort of thought that was going to happen. And uh, we're getting along very well with the governors. This whole situation with respect to talking to us about equipment and equipment needs, giving us a little bit of lead time, so important. All the supplies, uh, we're getting it to everybody like they never thought possible. But we'll ensure that we can rapidly deploy federal assets where and when they're needed especially on ventilators. We're actually getting some ventilators back. As you know, the state of California was great. They sent some back, which they won't need. And uh, Washington State, likewise. And we have some others coming back, so we're using them in areas we need them. 
We are pressing forward aggressively on the scientific frontier of the medical war. Uh, the companies I've spoke to, the four leading uh, — I call them the genius companies uh, — they're doing incredibly well with respect to uh, cures and uh, also with respect to a vaccine that's going to uh, protect us totally, protect us. And they have some great potential. It's going to take a little while yet, but they have some great potential, some great early results. And the governor has been working hard, and uh, we are working hard with the governors. There's been great coordination, especially over the last little while. We're giving them a lot of equipment, a lot of ventilators, but a lot of equipment of all types. And uh, I will protect you if your governor fails. If you have a governor that's failing, we're going to protect you. But the governors are working well with us over the last period of time. Um, today, in our stockpile of ventilators. And again, we need the stockpile so we can immediately move them from place to place wherever the monster hits. It's a monster. We have 8,675 ventilators right now in stock, ready to move. And we have all sorts of incredible soldiers. Our military is going to move them should they be needed in, as an example, if we need additional in New York or or the New York City area. You have state, you have city, and uh, spoke to Mayor de Blasio, and we really have a great, well-coordinated campaign with Mayor de Blasio. It's been really good. Spoke to Governor Cuomo. It's been great coordination. So if they need something, we have it. If Louisiana needs something, we have it. Same thing with Michigan. Same thing with Illinois. There are certain spots that are very hot, and we'll see what happens. But we'll know pretty much we'll have time and we'll be able to move it. In addition to the 8,675 ventilators, we have 2,200 arriving on April 13th. We have 5,500 arriving on May 4th. These are ones that we're building, for the most part. Uh, and we have, as you know, great companies building them. Ford, General Motors, uh, GE. We have really some great companies that are doing it. Uh, on May 18th, we have 12,000. On June 1st, we have 20,000. On June 29th, we have 60,000 ventilators coming. 60, 60. So we have a total of 110,000 ventilators coming over a short period of time. I don't think we'll need them. Hopefully, we won't need them. I don't think we'll need anywhere near them. But we'll have them for the future, and we'll also be able to help other countries who are desperate for ventilators. The U.K. called today, and they wanted to know, would it be possible to get 200, and we're going to work it out. we got to work it out. They've been great partners, United Kingdom, and uh, we're going to work it out for them. So they wanted 200. They needed them desperately. We now have 10 drugs in active trials, with 15 more soon to follow, as well as two vaccine candidates in active clinical trials. We'll do whatever it takes to secure needed medical supplies and bring more production of essential medicines back to our shores. We're doing that. We're bringing them back to our shores. A lot of these companies, they went a little bit haywire. They went away from this great country, and they had them produced elsewhere. So we're going to start bringing them back. And I've been talking about that for a long time, not only with medical, but lots of other things. America continues to perform more tests than any other nation in the world, and I think that's probably why we have more cases. Because when you look at some of these very large countries, they I know they I know for a fact that they have far more cases than we do, but they don't report them. We've uh, performed 1.87 million tests today, so that's 1,870,000 million tests. Think of that, 1,870,000 tests to date. And now we're performing them at a level that nobody's ever seen before. As we announced yesterday, CVS testing sites in Georgia and Rhode Island will be using Abbott Labs rapid five-minute tests. We're down to now five minutes. It's a five-minute test so that people can get their results back very quickly. And we're actively engaging on the problem of increased impacts. This is a real problem. And it's showing up uh, very strongly in our data on the African-American community. 
And we're doing everything in our power to address this challenge. It's a tremendous uh, challenge. It's terrible. And provide support to African-American citizens of this country who are going through a lot. Uh, but it's been disproportional. Uh, they're getting hit very, very hard. In fact, uh, while we have Tony here, I'd like to maybe have you come up and address that one, and then I'll continue. But if you could address that, it would be great, Tony, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. We have a, a particularly difficult problem of an exacerbation of a health disparity. We've known literally forever that diseases like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and asthma are disproportionately afflicting the minority populations, particularly the African Americans. Unfortunately, when you look at the predisposing conditions that lead to a bad outcome with coronavirus, the things that get people into ICUs that require intubation and often lead to death, they are just those very comorbidities that are unfortunately disproportionately prevalent in the African American population. So we're very concerned about that. It's very sad. It's nothing we can do about it right now except to try and give them the best possible care to avoid those complications. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. And, Tony, I think you're going to have some pretty accurate numbers over yes. the next few days, right? But they are very uh, — they're very nasty numbers, terrible numbers. In total, uh, 1,200 Abbott machines, Abbott laboratories have been fantastic, have been shipped now nationwide. Up to 500 more are being produced every week, and 50,000 testing cartridges are being manufactured per day. That means a lot of very fast tests. No nation in the world has developed a more diverse and robust testing capacity than the United States. We're dealing with other nations, helping them out, because the testing is very tough for them, and uh, our tests are very accurate. A lot of tests are out there, and they're not accurate at all. In fact, some of the tests, you don't have a clue what's going on. So we're working with other nations, trying to get them help also. At a time when many Americans are experiencing increased stress, anxiety, and personal loss, we must also ensure that our country can meet the mental health needs of those struggling in this crisis. There are people struggling. They're struggling. And some people are getting to know each other, frankly. Some families are getting to know each other on a positive note. But there are a lot of people struggling. On Thursday, I'll be speaking to leaders and advocates from the mental health organizations all across our country. And uh, we are going to be talking about resources and tools that we'll make available to them. They need help. And it's a, uh, it's a big problem. When you take something where it was the most successful country in the world, still is, the whole world is shut down. Think of it. We're down to uh, numbers that are incredible. Uh, as I said yesterday, I think it's 182 countries right now. 182 countries are under attack by the — by the scourge, by this virus. But as we wage medical war on the virus, we're also speeding economic relief to our people. It's incredible. We just had a meeting that was absolutely incredible with the banks. I spoke with leaders in the banking and finance industry about our efforts to help American workers and employers. As of today, small business has, pro has processed more than $70 billion in guaranteed loans and will provide much-needed relief for nearly a quarter of a million businesses already. So we are going to be um, providing tremendous amounts of money to the small businesses of our country who have been absolutely clobbered. And they'll be keeping open, and they'll be paying their employees, and they'll be all set to go. We're going to have a rocket upward. Uh, I want to thank David Solomon, CEO of Goldman Sachs, Brian Moynihan, CEO of Bank of America, Gordon Smith, co-president, COO of J.P. Morgan Chase, Charles Scharf, CEO of Wells Fargo, Michael Corbett, CEO of Citigroup, Al Kelly, CEO of Visa, Michael Mibach, CEO of MasterCard, Noah Wilcox, CEO, Chairman of Grand Rapids State Bank, and we had uh, numerous others also on the call, and I just appreciate them. Uh, they are — we're way ahead of schedule, by the way. We're way ahead of schedule. Uh, the 
Paycheck Protection Program has been incredible. So based on the incredible success of the program, I'm announcing that I'll be asking Congress to provide an additional $250 billion for the Paycheck Protection, which will help keep Americans employed to facilitate a quick and full recovery. Uh, we're doing very well. We're looking very bipartisan. A lot of people want to do it. And the, the plan is amazing. You know, they're, they're processing hundreds of thousands of loans. And this is the big banks that are doing it, the community banks. Uh, so, but the biggest banks right now in our country are doing it, and they're, they're doing it for a lot of reasons. One of them is they want to help people. The uh, WHO, that's the World Health Organization, receives vast amounts of money from the United States. And uh, we pay for a majority, the biggest portion of their money. And they uh, actually criticized and disagreed with my travel ban at the time I did it. And they were wrong. They've been wrong about a lot of things. And they had a lot of information early, and they didn't want to do very — they seemed to be very China-centric. And uh, we have to look into that. So we're going to look into it. We pay for — we give a majority of the money that they get. And it's much more than the 58. Fifty-eight million dollars is a small portion of what they've gotten over the years. Sometimes they get much more than that. Sometimes it's for programs that they're doing, and, and it's much bigger numbers. And if the programs are good, that's great, as far as we're concerned. But we want to look into it. World Health Organization, because they really are uh, — they called it wrong. They call it wrong. They really — they missed the call. They could have called it months earlier. They would have known. And uh, they should have known. And they probably did know. So we'll be looking into that very carefully. And we're going to put a hold on money spent to the WHO. We're going to put a very powerful hold on it. And we're going to see. It's a great thing if it works. But when they call every shot wrong, that's no good. We're in the midst of a great national struggle, one that requires the shared sacrifice of all Americans. In recent weeks, it's been remarkable to see so many companies and organizations and individuals, like the banks that I just told you about, biggest banks in the world, they stepped up to help small business. They're big business, small business. The small business will someday be the big business. But the small business is 50 percent of our economic strength. People don't realize when you add them up, but they just — they just rose to the occasion. Everybody's rising to the occasion. It's been incredible to watch. To honor and celebrate the extraordinary examples of patriotism and citizenship, we're seeing — I'm asking Americans to use the hashtag AmericaWorksTogether when sharing stories of how we're all working together, get through — getting through this ordeal in a fashion that nobody would have ever thought possible. It's been incredible, and that's why the numbers are so far much better. We want to keep it that way. If you look at the original projections, uh, if we did nothing, it would be uh, disastrous. If we we decided to do something, we closed it down, had no choice. It was a good move. That was a good move. The early China move was a good move. The early Europe move was a good move. Made a lot of good moves, but closing it down was a big statement. It was a big, important thing. But we're looking to have far fewer deaths than originally thought. And I think we're heading in that direction, but it's too early to talk about it. I don't even want to talk about it now, because we just want to work. And uh, I think that uh, people are doing an incredible job. The doctors, the nurses, the firefighters, the police. All medical people, what they're doing, the bravery that they're displaying is just incredible. Every citizen should take immense pride in the selflessness and all of the courage and compassion of our people, the workers, the, the people that are working, and construction workers going into hospitals, knowing nothing about uh, this problem other than it's dangerous, and they go in there to rebuild sections of hospitals, and you have people in really big trouble right next door. They know nothing about it. All they know is they're going to get it done. They're going to fix that wing so they can have more people in there. It's incredible. But this is a national spirit that won our independence and settled the frontier and explored the horizons of space. And that's what we're doing. I mean, this is all 
This is all new territory. It unlocked the miracles of science, and we're, we're doing that. When you — I wish you could have heard the calls I had yesterday with these great uh, companies that come up with cures to diseases, and the success they've had over the last 15 years is really amazing. So I just want to thank all of them. They're working very hard. Uh, they're working with U.K. right now, and the U.K. doctors hopefully helping with their great prime minister. But these people are really a tremendous signs of success are uh, staring us right in the face. I think we're going to have something that's going to be great in terms of vaccines and in terms of everything else that they're doing. Uh, just helping, really helping us, helping the people of our country and helping ultimately the people of the world. So I want to thank you all for being here. I, I will take some questions, and then I'm going to give it over to the Vice President, and they're going to go into great detail on what we're doing and all of the successful supplies and medical equipment that we're getting. All of the ventilators, I've said it, but you can go over it in more detail if you'd like, but we're taking in uh, and building thousands and thousands of ventilators, and they're very high quality. I said you got to go for the quality, and these are quality companies doing it. So, because there is a big difference between a good ventilator and a not-so-good ventilator, Tony, right? We've seen that. And uh, big difference. So, we're going top of the line. Steve, please. The acting Navy Secretary submitted his resignation today, Modley. Uh, why did that become necessary, and what, what role did you have in this, sir? Well, I had no role in it. Uh, I've, I've heard — I don't know him, but I've heard he was a very good man. And uh, it was a — the whole thing was a very unfortunate uh, — the captain should not have written a letter. He didn't have to be Ernest Hemingway. He made a mistake, but he had a bad day. And uh, I hate seeing bad things happen. Man made a mistake. But, you know, you shouldn't be writing letters, and you sh you're in the military. You're the captain of a great ship, and you shouldn't be writing letters and sending them to many people. And then it gets out to the media. And, you know, the question is, how did it get out to the media? So there's a lot of bad things happened there. And uh, I had heard he did because he didn't want to cause any disturbance for our country. So that was a — because he, he wouldn't have had to resign. I would not have asked him. I don't know him. Uh, I didn't speak to him. But uh, he did that, I think, just to end — end that problem. And I think in one — in really many ways, that was a very — unselfish thing for him to do. What should happen now to Commander Crozier, who left? Well, they're going to look at that. I think uh, the Secretary of Defense, as you know, is — is uh, you know Mark Esper, and he's very capable. And I think he's looking at that right now. They're — they're going to uh, just take it under regular Navy channels to see what they want to do. But um, he made a mistake, but he shouldn't have done that. And uh, your secretary probably shouldn't have said quite what he said. Uh, he didn't have to resign, but he felt it would be better for the country. So, I, you know, I think it's uh, — it will end it quickly. Yeah, please. So, Mr. President, a couple on the economic front. Um, the $250 billion that was added today yeah. or will be added for the Small Business Loan Program brings it to $600 billion in total. Do you, do you think that figure is enough? Uh, might well, we're going to find out. The line. You know, when you see hundreds of thousands of applications, don't forget, they're for $3,000, for 7000 some for a couple of million. I guess one of the banks said a couple of million. So they're for different, very varying amounts of money. Uh, and there's a limit on the top, and then there's really no limit on the bottom as to what it might be. But it's really popular. It's hundreds of thousands of applications. They really like it. What I like is it keeps these companies together, these little companies. Just like we're going to help the airlines and the big companies, we're going to help the little companies. And the banks are running — nobody's equipped to do a thing like that, but the banks are equipped. So the banks are doing it. Big banks, small banks. We have many banks, community banks. And they're processing the loans, and they'll be able to watch it and make sure it's done properly. I'll talk today, sir, as well about potentially reopening the economy in the upcoming weeks. You mentioned the other day about a potential economic task force. Can you give us some sort of update as to where well, we're that thinking may about that? But we want to open up, and we want to get it open soon. That's why I think maybe we're getting to the very top of the curve. I spoke with Governor Cuomo, and. He seems to think that he's getting close, and I think a lot of people think that a lot of places are getting close. We want to start heading that — hitting the downside, and I think we're going to be — this is going to be a very uh, difficult week, however. This week will be a very difficult week. 
because that's the most difficult week when you're at that top position. And uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. It does open up. What can the federal government do? Well, because the federal government the has done a lot, and it's going to do a lot. We want to — I really think that with the stimulus, we can be maybe even beyond — we're going to do perhaps infrastructure, which you wouldn't have gotten approved before, and now people are looking to do it. And the beauty is we're paying zero interest, or very close to zero interest. In some cases, we're paying actually zero. We have no interest charge. And, and uh, the dollar is very strong, and people are investing in the dollar. They want, you know, the fact that we have the strong currency. We have the currency. We, our currency is, is everything. And other companies, other countries want to be in our currency. So we're, we're getting all of the investment wanting to come into the dollar. The dollar is the strength. The dollar is the whole ballgame. We have a strong dollar. Other currencies are going down, way, way down in some cases. You look at other countries, I won't mention them, but other countries are going down 22 percent, 25 percent, 28 percent. And it's very hard for them. That makes it much more difficult with us. Our currency is relatively now stronger than it ever was, or it was over the last few years relative to other countries. It's always relative to other countries, but our currency is very strong. So, therefore, people want to invest. If we do a bond issue to do infrastructure, everybody wants a piece of that issue, even at zero interest. Yeah, please. Thank you, sir. Did you see these memos that uh, reportedly Peter Navarro wrote back in January? When did you see them? And how does that these memos sort of square with what you've often said that nobody could have predicted this? It sounds like he was predicting. I didn't see him, but I heard he wrote some memos talking about pandemic. Uh, I didn't see him. I didn't look for him either. But that was about the same time as I felt that we should do it. We, that was about the same time that I closed it down. Uh, I asked him about it just a little while ago because I read something about a memo. I said, did you do a memo? I didn't look for I didn't see it. I didn't ask him to show it to me. He said, yes, I talked about the possibility of a pandemic. Nobody said it's going to happen, but, you know, there is a possibility. There always has been a possibility, but people wouldn't talk about it. Uh, but it was right about the time that I closed it down. And interestingly, the World uh, Health Organization was not in favor of us closing it down. And if we didn't close it down, we would have lost hundreds of thousands more lives. So he did a good, he did a good thing. Yeah. So at the time, though, when, when uh, Peter Navarro did circulate those memos, you were still downplaying the threat of coronavirus in the U.S. You were saying things like, I think it's a problem that's going to go away within Which a couple right of days. About. It, go, it will go away. You said within a couple of days, the cases will be down to zero. Well, the cases really didn't build up for a while. But you have to understand, I'm a cheerleader for this country. I don't want to create havoc and shock and everything else. But ultimately, when I was saying that, I'm also closing it down. I obviously was concerned about it because I closed down our country to China, which was heavily infected. I then closed it down to Europe. That's a big move, closing it down from China and then closing it down from Europe and then ultimately closing it down to the U.K. So — and it was right about that time. But I'm not going to go out and start screaming, this could happen, this could happen. So, again, as president, I think a president has to be a cheerleader for their country. But at the same time I'm cheerleading, I'm also closing down a very highly infected place, specifically the location, as you know, in China that had the problems. And we're closing it down, but we close it down to all of China. Then we close it down to all of Europe. Those were big moves, and it was right about that time. Sorry, sir, sir, just a quick, just, just a quick follow up, Mr. President. Did you just Mr. learn President? about this today? Say? You learned about the memo today? Just I read today. about it maybe a day ago, two days ago. Do you feel like someone in your staff, among your staff or Peter Navarro himself should have told you about the memo no, not earlier? No, it was a recommendation. It was a feeling that he had. Um, I think he told certain people in the staff, but it didn't matter. I didn't see it, but I did. I closed it down. I don't remember it even being discussed. We had a meeting where there were a lot of people. Most people felt they should not close it down, that we shouldn't close down to China. But I felt we had to do it. And that was at almost the exact same time as the memo. If you had read the memo at the time, how would that have changed the steps you took or the statements that you I don't want to change, because I did. I basically did what the memo said, and the memo was, you know, the memo was pretty good 
memo from the standpoint that uh, he talked, I guess. I didn't see it yet. He was saying that the U.S. would lose, warning that the U.S. could lose trillions of dollars and millions of lives. Well, you're not going to lose millions of lives, but you, you'll lose plenty of money. But uh, I couldn't have done it any better because it was about the same time and I closed it down to China. And just last of you, so you maintain confidence in him, in Peter Burke. Of course I maintain confidence. He wrote a memo and he was right. And uh, I haven't seen the memo. I'll see it later on after this. But uh, it didn't matter whether I saw it or not because I, I acted on my own. I guess I had the same instincts as Peter. Peter's a smart guy and he's a good guy. And he's done a wonderful job. But he wrote a memo, and I guess he talked to various people about it. But ultimately, I did what the memo, more or less what the memo said, just about the time the memo came out. I closed it down. I took a lot of heat. The World you know, Health Organization was very much against. They didn't like it. They actually put out statements about it. Uh, in all fairness to Joe Biden, he called me xenophobic. Like, I don't like China. I like China. I like the Chinese people are phenomenal people. So I was called xenophobic. I was called racist. How could I do a thing like this? Now, since then, Joe said that he was wrong, and he said that I was right. But I closed it down, and I was called names by uh, some of the morning uh, show hosts who don't have a clue what they're talking about. They're not smart people. And I was called all sorts of names when I closed it down to China. Now they try and hide that, you know, the tape of them saying terrible things. But that was a great decision. If I didn't do it, if I didn't do that, we would have had hundreds of thousands more people dying. Yeah, please. Um, you talked a lot about the WHO, and I was wondering, Dr. Fauci had, had discussed them earlier, so if I could ask you a question about that. Well, he respects the WHO, and I think that's, that's good. And he's worked with them for a long time. But they did give us some pretty bad uh, play calling. They've also, I think, given lots of countries in the world uh, accurate coronavirus testing that's been central to your guys' data modeling. And so well, that I don't know. I can only say that with regard to us, they're taking a lot of heat because they didn't want the borders closed. They called it wrong. Uh, they called, they really called, I would say, every aspect of it wrong. So it's until the funding freeze I'm does not, not happy about it. Look, we fund it. Take a look. I mean, go through step by step. They said there's no big deal, there's no big problem, there's no nothing. And then ultimately, when I closed it down, they actually said that I made a mistake in closing it down, and it, it turned out to be right. But at the time, they, you know, they did that. So we're just going to take a look at it. You know, we fund it. And, and they seem to be, you know, I said recently in social media, I said they seem to be very China-centric. That's a nice way of saying it. But they seem to be very China-centric. And they, they, they seem to err to always on the side of China. And we fund it. You know, so I want to look into it. Yes, please. Thanks. A quick follow-up on that. So is the time to freeze funding to the WHO during a pandemic? No, maybe not. I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but we're going to look at it. You did say that. We give a tremendous – no, I didn't. I said we're going to look at it. We're going to investigate it. We're going to look at it. But we will look at ending funding. Yeah, to, because to, you know what? They called it wrong. And if you look back over the years, even, they're very much uh, — everything seems to be very biased toward China. That's not right. I wanted to follow up. You talked about African-Americans and how they've been disproportionately affected by the coronavirus. Seems to be, unfortunately. Do you plan on requiring the CDC, uh, any federal agencies or state agents, public uh, — public places doing tests and private companies doing tests to collect that data yep. on the race of the people being tested and the the race of the people being treated and the well, we're just seeing tremendous we're seeing tremendous uh, evidence that african americans are affected at a far greater percentage number than other citizens of our country because we're dealing with our country now we're looking at it from a worldwide standpoint Tony Fauci is looking at it very strongly, but these numbers have started to come out, and they're they're very strong and they're pretty obvious. I mean, you, you, you were talking that, about you will release that. Sue, would you like to talk about that for a second, please? I think one of the things that we're going to be doing with our Medicare data is to do that analysis. We're going to look back at the last month or so and look at, you know, related type illnesses going forward. We now have a code for coronavirus, so we can actually stratify by demographic information so we can look at um, race as a factor. We can also look at what the underlying health issues are as well. Um, so we'll be providing that data very shortly.
But we will be doing that analysis. We're it's working on that uh, very hard. This is something that's come up over the last, I hadn't heard this, and then over the last few days, this has come up more and more. And I don't mean by a little bit. I mean many times. It's a real thing. Now, we want to find cures. We want to find therapeutics. We want to find vaccines, because that will solve everybody's problem. But why is it that the African American community is so much, you know, numerous times more than everybody else? And we want to find the reason to it. And Dr. Fauci, Seema, both of them and others are working on this. And they're going to have very good, I would say over the next, in less than a week, I think you're going to have very good statistics. Couple of days. Something specifically couple. aimed at those communities that are being hard hit, those black communities. Well, that we're helping them a lot. But what's happening is we're trying to find out why is it that it's three and four times. Now, maybe that's not going to be the final number, but why is it three or four times uh, more so for the black community as opposed to other people? It doesn't make sense. And I don't like it. And we're going to have statistics over the next probably two to three days, okay? Mr. President. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question on behalf of myself and a colleague who couldn't be here due to social distancing. Sure. Thank you. Um, who are you with? Who? With Hearst Newspapers. I'm the print ruler today. Thank you. Um, some banks are only providing paycheck protection program loans to clients with whom they have existing banking relationships. And you spoke to banking CEOs today. I wonder if I you'll, you'll ask them, these lenders, to accept applications from all small businesses, sure. not just the businesses with whom they have existing Okay, they'll be doing that. But we're also working with small community banks, so they will be doing that. It's a question I've already spoken about. Okay. I mean, in many cases, they have long-term relationships with thousands of companies. I was amazed to see how many, you know, you saw the number of applications. It's hundreds of thousands. It's a lot of work. But uh, I did ask that question, and they are working on that. Yeah. Thank you. And my, my second question from a colleague is, uh, Congressman Jerry Connolly, a Democrat from Northern Virginia, told uh, the local D.C. CBS station that you personally requested the CARES Act stimulus bill be stripped of $25 billion for the Postal Service. Connolly claims that unless the USPS gets that $25 billion, the agency will be run out of money by June. He accuses you of hastening the demise of the Postal Service. Could you well, respond the biggest, to that, please? Uh, oh, uh, I'm the reason the Postal Service. The Postal Service has lost billions of dollars every year for many, many years. I'm the demise. This is the new one. I'm now the demise of the Postal Service. I'll tell you who's the demise of the Postal Service. So these Internet companies that give their stuff to the Postal Service, packages, and I don't know why they're not. You know, I don't run the Postal Service. You have a group of people, so-called independent people, and they run it. But these packages are, uh, they deliver, they lose money every time they deliver a package for Amazon or these other internet companies, these other companies that deliver. They drop everything in the post office, they say, you deliver it. And uh, if they'd raise the prices by actually a lot, then you'd find out that the post office could make money or break even. But they don't do that, and I'm trying to figure out why. These are independent boards. They were appointed by other administrations. They're sort of long-term. They're there for a long time. And I've been talking to them also. You can look it up. Take a look. They should raise, they have to raise the prices to these companies that walk in and drop thousands of, of uh, packages on the floor of the post office and say, deliver it. And they make money, but the post office gets killed. Okay? So they ought to do that, and we're looking into it. And we've been pushing them now for over a year. And you know that because you've seen the stories. I'm pushing them. Uh, it's not fair for them to, to these great, wonderful, modern companies. They walk into our old post office with all these routes that could never be built. You could never build them. They go into areas that you, you could never do. And they say, here, deliver this. And they lose a lot of money per package. And they have to raise their prices. But this Postal Commission doesn't do it. Now, we just got a chance to appoint a couple of people onto the commission, as I understand it, and that's good. But they have to raise their prices, otherwise they're just going to lose a lot of money. And tell your Democrat friend that uh, he ought to focus on that, because if he focused on that, he could truly save the post office. Post office has been losing billions of dollars a year for many, many years. And uh, have him take a look at that, because that's the way to solve the problem. Thank you so yeah, much, please, Mr. Sorry. President. Thank you so much. Mr. President, you say this week will be very painful, very difficult, but a few weeks ago you say this was just like a flu. What have you learned? I didn't say two weeks ago it was a, a flu. Weeks. 
Uh, well, you know the question what? is, Mr. President, Excuse what have me. you learned that Ready? you could offer as an advice to foreign leaders who is still are skeptical about uh, this pandemic and who are uh, against social distancing? What is your advice? What okay. have you learned? You said I said it was just like a flu. So the worst pandemic we ever had in this world was a flu, and it was called — you know that. It was in 1917, 1918. And anywhere from 50 to 100 million people died. That was a flu, okay? So you could say that I said it was a flu, or you could say the flu is nothing to sneeze at. My question, Mr. President, what can you offer as an advice to foreign leaders who are skeptical, skeptical about this pandemic and who are against social distancing? Well, I think there aren't too many of them. If you look throughout the world, and everyone, just about everyone that has practiced that is now closing up. Well, the U.K. was an example. Uh, now, they talk about Sweden, but Sweden is suffering very gravely. You know that, right? Sweden did that. The herd, they call it the herd. Uh, Sweden is suffering very, very badly. Uh, it's a way of doing it, but uh, the — you know, everybody has been watching everybody else. And so far, almost every country has done it the way we've done it. We've chosen to do it. If we didn't do it that way, we would have lost hundreds of thousands of more people. Okay. Mr. President, Mr. President uh, there's voting going on today in Wisconsin. There were reports of uh, thousands of people waiting in hours-long lines um, as they've had to weigh their own personal health and their, and their civic responsibility. Uh, what, do you think that the Supreme Court was right in its decision that, sort of that, that voting should go forward, the absentee extension should not take place? Right. Yeah. Look, uh, the Supreme Court, of course they were right, because what the Democrats wanted and, — and you know what this happened. I supported a man named Justice Kelly, who's Daniel Kelly, highly respected justice. And I supported him just the other day, social media. I know of him. He's a just a, you know, fantastic judge, justice. And I endorsed him. And as soon as I endorsed him, they wanted to move the election. They didn't want to move the election. As soon as I endorsed him, uh, the Wisconsin Democrats say, oh, let's move the election to two months later. Three. They didn't mind having the election until I endorsed him, which is very interesting. And now they talk about, oh, safety, safety. Well, it was 15 minutes after I put out an endorsement that they said, we have to move the election. They didn't want to move the election before that. The other thing they want to do, which is crazy, at the end of the election, they wanted to have one week for proxies to come in or mail ballots. Now, mail ballots, they cheat, okay? People cheat. Mail ballots are a very dangerous thing for this country because they're cheaters. They go and collect them. They're fraudulent in many cases. You got to vote. And they should have voter ID, by the way. You want to really do it right. You have voter ID. But the Democrats — and this was turned over in the Supreme Court yesterday. I give great credit to the Court. They actually didn't want to have an election day. They wanted to have election day. And then a week after election day, you choose your — all these ballots come in. These mailed ballots come in. The mail ballots are corrupt, in my opinion. And they collect them, and they get people to go in and sign them. And then they — they're forgeries in many cases. It's a horrible thing. And so what happened is, the Democrats in Wisconsin, they had no problem with the election being today until I endorsed the Republican candidate, Justice Kelly, Daniel Kelly. And as soon as I endorsed him, they went crazy. They went crazy. And you know that's true. And now all of a sudden, because go back two weeks, go back two days. They didn't want to move the election. They were having the election. They were fine because they thought they were going to win the election. Then I endorsed them, and all of a sudden, they think they're not. Now I understand there are lines that go back a long way. I hope they're going to vote for Justice Kelly, okay? Mr. President, do you think that Americans can choose no. so. um, With millions of pills of hydroxychloroquine donated, is there a plan or system in place to track yeah. the, the potential yeah. side effects? Well, you saw there the representative. Serious harm. So, is look, there a plan look, to is there a plan? The side effects. The, 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 side effects the side effects are the least of it. You have people dying all over the place, and uh, generally, uh, the side effects are really with the Z pack, having to do with the heart. The Z pack, that's the antibiotic, not with the uh, hydroxychloroquine. So, uh, a woman last night, I watched her on one of the shows, good show, Laura, and she was. Uh, she thought she was dead. 
She's a representative from Michigan. She was uh, just in horrible shape for 12 days, 14 days. She thought she was dead. I think she said that her doctor said, she's, you know, it's going to be very tough. She saw me talking about this, and she asked her husband to go to the drugstore. Now, this is a Democrat representative, a person that, you know, perhaps wouldn't be voting for me. Uh, I think she'll be voting for me now, even if she's a Democrat, even if she's a Democrat representative. And they went to the store, which I made available, because we have millions of doses. We have, I think, 29 million doses of this drug. And she asked her husband, she said, please go out. I'm not going to make it. Please, You have to hear her story. Please go out, get it. He went at 10 o'clock in the evening to the drugstore. He got it. He gave it to her. Now, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't say it works like this at all. Four hours later, she awoke and she said, I feel better. And then shortly thereafter, she felt great. This is a woman that thought she was going to die. It's I mean, she's a Democrat, representative, highly respected woman, African-American woman. I don't know if you saw it. As you asked a question about African-American, she was an African-American woman, a great woman. Her, her, her manner of speaking, her, the way she told the story was beautiful. I asked my husband to go and get it. He got it. She is now okay. I mean, she was interviewed last night on television. And she thanked me. She thanked me even in a tweet. She said, I want to thank President Trump. He saved my life. Look, I don't say that happens with everybody, but that's a beautiful story. There are many of those stories. And I say, try it. Okay, please. I mean, if you're in trouble, if you're going to die, and you're going to die, I mean, it's, you're not going to die from this bill. Now, there could be some side effects, but the side effects is really more so from the ZPEC. those side effects? No, no. It, I, Doctors have to recommend it. I want doctors. I'm not saying, I'm not a doctor. I'm just saying we hear great results. And some people say, let's go to a laboratory. Let's test it for a couple of years. And no, I got, we got people dying in this country and all over the world right now, not in a couple of years. They're dying. As we speak, there are people dying. And I really think it's a great thing to try just based on what I know. Again, I'm not a doctor. And I say, get a physician's approval. And they have physicians in these hospitals, great physicians, brave physicians. They also say it's good for the hospital workers to take them, that it's, uh, you know, it uh, keeps it away, keeps it out of your system. I don't know. But there's a lot of good examples. And, uh, you know, we have a 1,500 case study going in New York, and it's almost complete. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, can you but I appreciate that woman. She was great. You have to see it to believe it. The way she spoke, it was like a miracle. And this was not a fan of mine. But she's a fan of mine now, and I'm very honored by it. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Can you talk about your decision to remove Glenn Fine from the um, Pandemic Response Accountability Committee? and? Does that move and some of the criticism you've leveled at IGs, how does the American public have confidence that there'll be yeah. oversight? Well, we have a lot of IGs in from the Obama era. And as you know, it's a presidential decision. And I left them largely. I mean, changed some, but I left them. Uh, but when we have, uh, you know, uh, reports of bias and when we have different things coming in, I don't know Fine. I don't think I ever met Fine. I heard the name. It wasn't an Obama. I heard the name. I don't know where he is. Maybe he was from Clinton. Okay, you check that out. Okay, maybe it's from Clinton. But we did uh, change him, but we changed uh, a number. We have about seven nominations in, I believe. We put seven very, very highly qualified people for the IG position. And, you know, that's a decision that I could have made three years ago and I could have made two years ago. And uh, But we're putting in, uh, not so much for him, we're putting in seven names. I think it was seven. And they're going in now. Yeah. Mr. So President, then, yeah. when you talk about the WHO being China-centric, what exactly are you talking about? Is it because China is underplayed how many victims I don't know. they, they seem to come down on the side of China. Don't close your borders to China. Don't do this. They don't report what's really going on. They didn't see it, and yet they were there. They didn't see what was going on in Wuhan. They didn't see it. How do you not see it? 
They didn't see it. They didn't report it. If they did see it, they must have seen it, but they didn't report it. Please, go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, just turning back to the voting in Wisconsin and those long lines, who will be responsible and who should be held responsible if people get sick after they voted? Look, all I did was endorse a candidate. I don't know anything about their lines. I don't know anything about their voting. I love the state. But you also encourage I want to get out the and vote state. today as well. Will you yeah. take some of the responsibility if some of those I won the state, sick? which is rare for a Republican to do, but I won the state of Wisconsin. I'm going to win it again because we've been great to the people of Wisconsin, as you know, with our policies. And they like me and I like them. But all I did was endorse a candidate that's highly qualified, very respected person. And all hell broke loose as soon as I did that. And then all of a sudden, they want to change. Before I endorsed them, they didn't want to change this voting uh, area. There was no problem with the Democrats voting until I endorsed the candidate. Then they said, let's move it two months. Let's move it three months later. Safety, 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 right? All of a sudden, they want safety. Well, before I did the endorsement, they didn't talk about safety. It was fine for months. For months, it was fine. It was always going to be. And now I endorse, and they want safety. So, you know, that sounds. Thank you. I, just to follow up on that, how does the the election, how, ha, them holding this election in Wisconsin, line up with the social distancing recommendations that have come from your? Well, there you have to ask the people that you have a, a Democrat in Wisconsin as governor. Ask him. That's his problem. Okay, he should be doing it. Again, some governors fail, and I won't let them fail, because when they fail, I'll help. But that's run by Democrats right now, okay? It's run by Democrats. You had a great but Republican. Is it possible to socially distance when you're voting? You're going to have crowds. You have to speak to the crowds. governor. What you should do is call the governor of Wisconsin and ask him that question. But also ask him, how come it was okay to do this until I endorsed the candidate? And as soon as I endorsed him, these lines are formed, and I hear, Mike, the lines are through the roof. So, you know, hopefully they're going to vote, they're going to vote for the right candidate. Yeah, please. Can I just check in on oil again today? I was wondering if... Oil? Yeah. Where is it today? <laughs> well, I was wondering if you... No, no, where's the price? Give me the price. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, How can you ask a question when you don't know the price? I'll look it up for you. Okay, let me do somebody uh, else. Go ahead. So, you were highly critical of mail-in voting, mailing your mail-in ballots for voting. I think mail-in voting ago, is but horrible. You voted by it's mail corrupt. in Florida's election last month, didn't uh, you? Sure, I, I could vote by mail for the. How do you reconcile because I'm that? allowed to. Well, that's called out of state. You know why I voted? Because I happen to be in the White House, and I won't be able to go to Florida to vote. The but let me just say, well, there's state a big difference between. Somebody that's out of state and does a ballot and everything sealed, certified, and everything else. You see what you have to do with the certifications. And you get thousands and thousands of people sitting in somebody's living room signing ballots all over the place. No, I think that mail-in voting is a terrible thing. I think if you vote, you should go. And even the concept of early voting is not the greatest, because a lot of things happen. But it's okay. But you should go and you should vote. I think you should go and you should vote. You look at what they do, where they grab thousands of mail-in ballots and they dump it. I'll tell you what, and I don't have to tell you, you can look at the statistics. There's a lot of dishonesty going along with mail-in voting, mail-in ballots. You've heard, you've, heard, you've heard state officials to buy their own medical equipment. The federal officials are kind of swooping in and scooping up those orders. How are you ensuring that it's being I've been distributed that so fairly? And is well, we're getting, we're getting great prices on equipment. We're getting great prices on equipment, and we're helping the states. And the governors are very thankful. Mike Pence had a call yesterday with — every governor was on the call, and every — it was like a love fest. They're very happy. I don't know if they tell that to the press. Some of them don't. Some of them will never say good to the press, but they know we've done a great job. Not a good job, a great job. The state officials are widely No, saying no, that. I think sometimes it does. And what we say is, let us know, and we will immediately drop out of the bidding. 
Let us know. And we do that, and we drop out. Sometimes we tell them to drop out because we've got a good price. You and then we'll deliver to them. Yeah, go ahead behind, please. Go yes, ahead. thank you, Mr. President. No, 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 not you. In front, please. Yeah. Um, some states have had trouble with getting accurate death counts, particularly because of lack of testing or no Did uniform. Did you see death counts? Yes, because of lack of testing and no uniform system to put know. that when into. When you say death counts, I think they're pretty accurate on the death count. Somebody dies, I think the states have been pretty accurate. No That's a big deal, what you're just saying. No, the death counts, I think they're very, very accurate. I do say this. I think if you look at China and if you look at some of these very large countries, uh, when you talk about cases, number of cases, I would be willing to bet they have more cases than we do, but they don't do the testing like we do. But you look at, you know, other, you look at some of these certain countries, and I would be willing to bet a lot that they had, have more cases, but we're more accurate. And our testing is done very accurately, and we've got a good process. Did you have one? Yes, please. Mr. President, um, oh, yeah. you, have, you have been very consistently supportive of a payroll relief tax. Um, a what? Payroll? That, uh, payroll relief. Now, I know you're still busy trying to implement role, um, right. phase three, but as we move towards pay phase four, yeah. are there still obstacles to that? Because that would put money in American pockets like consistently. Yeah, you're right. I would love to see a payroll. Good questions. I would love to see a payroll tax cut. And I think on behalf of uh, the people, it would be quick. Now, it's a longer term. You know, it's a longer time because it's over a period of a year or whatever you want to make it. Uh, but I would love to see a payroll tax cut. There are many people that would like to see it as a permanent tax cut, payroll tax cut. What is stopping it from uh, well, the Democrats right now are stopping it. What are their reasons? I don't know. You know, I don't know. If maybe they think it's good politics to stop it. But you'd get a lot of people, a lot of money immediately. You'd, the payroll tax cut would be a great thing for this country. I would like to have it regardless of this. But this would be a fantastic time to have the payroll tax cut. The Democrats are stopping it, but I don't think they're, you know, I think it's, I think there's a certain flexibility. I think it's something that we should do both for business and the people, but this would get money into the hands of small business immediately, money in the hands of people, the workers and people immediately. And it would be over an extended period and it would be simple to do. It's so easy to do. It's a great tax cut and I'd love you to speak to the Democrats and let's get it done. So I'm going to give this now to Vice President Pence and uh, they're going to go over some very good statistics with everybody and we'll have a couple of answers on that because we're working very hard on the African-American community with respect to what's going on because it's not it's not good. I don't like it. Uh, and uh, we're going to have some very good statistics, Tony, I think, over the next couple of days. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all. A few updates, and then I'll, uh, I'll introduce Dr. Deborah Birch to talk about what we're seeing. Uh, around the country, what the data is uh, telling us. But uh, suffice it to say, as the President said uh, several times, this is a very tough week in America. Uh, and our hearts go out to all of the families that have lost loved ones to the coronavirus. But uh, I know I speak uh, for uh, the entire White House Coronavirus Task Force uh, when I say uh, our hearts are with the people of the greater New York City area today. Um, as we stand here today, um, uh, in the midst of, uh, of heartbreaking numbers of losses in New York City, I, I also want to assure the American people that there, there's reason for hope. Uh, as, uh, as Dr. Burks will enumerate in just a few moments, despite the increase in losses, um, uh, as, uh, as Governor Cuomo articulated today, uh, hospital admissions uh, continue to decline. Uh, and uh, in our report early this morning uh, from Dr. Burks, we continue to see evidence of stabilization uh, in some of the areas around the country of the most significant outbreak, the New York metro area, including New Jersey, Long Island and Connecticut, New Orleans metro area, Detroit, Boston, Chicago, and and Denver, 
uh, as Dr. Burks will explain, continue to uh, give evidence of stabilization, uh, which in a very real sense uh, is evidence that the American people are putting into practice the social distancing, uh, the president's guidelines for our nation. Uh, and for that, uh, as, uh, uh, as the president said earlier today, uh, we, we thank the American people. Um, even in the midst of hardship and loss at a time when we've seen more than 385,000 Americans test positive uh, for the coronavirus and more than 12,000 succumb to this illness. The evidence that Dr. Burks will describe to you will show that the American people know our future is in our hands. And so as I begin, allow me just simply and to continue to urge every American to put into practice the guidance you're receiving from your state and local authorities. Take it to heart, take it seriously, and share it with your family and your friends, uh, and, 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 and know that you're making a difference, America, because you truly are. Uh, today, for my part, I spoke to over 500 small business owners um, in a conference call, and there I heard about their enthusiasm for the Paycheck Protection Program. And that call took place before uh, the President uh, had the Secretary of Treasury indicate our interest in acquiring another $250 billion for that program. As of this morning, more than $60 billion in forgivable loans that would cover two months of paychecks at small businesses had already been distributed, and the number is going to grow literally by uh, the day. Uh, we also had a very productive call today with um, with some other American heroes. You know, the we all have in our hearts and in our minds our health care workers, and I'll speak for a moment about the supplies and resources that we're working uh, to provide for all of them. But right below our health care workers are all the people that are working in critical infrastructure around the country, and, and uh, um, some of the most important people are working in food supply. I mean, from, from the farmers and the ranchers uh, to our, our processors, to our distributors, to our truckers, to our grocers. Americans are keeping food on the table for our fellow Americans. And let me begin by just saying what I said to uh, some of the most prominent CEOs of uh, meat and grain industry companies in the country, companies like Tyson Foods and, and Hormel today. Uh, not just to uh, these companies, but to all the hardworking people working in food supply today, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing to keep those grocery store shelves stocked. Thank you for showing up for work every day and, and working hard to keep that food supply rolling in America. You know, it was more than five weeks ago that the president brought in all of the, all the grocery store leaders in the country, and there he received a commitment that no grocery store in America would close, and they haven't. Uh, but it's been these heroic Americans from the farm to the fork that have made it possible for Americans to have one less worry, uh, and they are truly inspiring heroes. Now, that being said, I did hear from the industry today that there have been reports of, uh, of some plants uh, having reduced capacity because of people having concerns about exposure to the coronavirus. In fact, over the last several days, there's a have been some incidents of worker absenteeism and some plants have actually been forced to close temporarily. And so on behalf of the president, on behalf of our entire team, and on behalf of a grateful nation, let me just say to all of you that are working in the food industry at every level across the country, just understand that you are vital. Uh, you are giving a great service to the people of the United States of America. Uh, and we need you to continue as a part of what we call our critical infrastructure to show up uh, and do your job and know that we're going to continue to work tirelessly in working with all of your companies to make sure that that workplace uh, is safe. With that being said, let me talk about the other heroes that we always mention at this podium today that uh, Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci invariably mention, and that's our health care workers. At the President's direction, we've been working tirelessly, literally around the clock, to identify resources around the country and around the world to make sure our health care workers have the support that they need. With uh, some 51 major disaster declarations, most recently Minnesota uh, being approved, uh, states have stood up 27,000 National Guard, but 
Personnel wise, before the end of business today, there will be more than 3,000 Department of Defense and Health and Human Service medical personnel on the ground in the greater New York City area. And those people will be redeployed once that region of the country moves through the coronavirus epidemic in that area. And, uh, and we salute those extraordinary patriotic Americans for stepping forward to bring real relief to our health care workers. With regard to equipment, uh, uh, Admiral Polovchek reported to the task force throughout the course of the day today that uh, we have continued to distribute ventilators across the country. Uh, we're, uh, we're sending additional ventilators from the Strategic National Stockpile. Uh, Maryland will receive 50 ventilators. Delaware will receive 50 ventilators. Uh, and uh, uh, that will leave uh, more than 8,400 ventilators still in the national stockpile. Uh, one correction from yesterday, after uh, our press briefing yesterday, uh, FEMA made a different uh, decision with regard to what the state of California generously made available. And uh, the ventilators, some 500 ventilators that uh, we again want to thank uh, Governor Gavin Newsom and the people of California uh, for donating to our nation's efforts. 100 of those are being deployed to New York, 100 to New Jersey. 100 to Illinois, 50 to Maryland, 50 to Washington, D.C., 50 to Delaware, and 50 to Nevada. Uh, with regard to, to the remainder uh, of what we call personal protective equipment, again, we've been literally leaving no stone unturned anywhere in the country, anywhere around the world. And as Admiral Polovchak described just a couple of days ago, we've established uh, not just an air bridge, but a control tower system modeled after military logistics out of FEMA. And while, uh, while FEMA is acquiring a small portion of, uh, of what's being acquired, 90% uh, of the supplies are being, are being routed directly into our massive distribution system. And FEMA is using the data that Dr. Burks provides to target those resources to the areas most in need. Uh, I asked them to break out a few details about resources that just in the last five days have been distributed, and I hope it's an encouragement to healthcare workers all across uh, these regions and around the country about the efforts that are being made uh, to make sure they have what they need. You can see the New York metro area, including New Jersey, just in the last five days, uh, more than 6 million N95 masks, more than 6 million surgical masks. Uh, uh, when Governor Cuomo and I last spoke, he told me there was a, a, a real challenge for medical gowns uh, in the New York City area and in New Jersey as well, uh, and 2.8 million uh, gowns were distributed to that region as well. Uh, going next to New Orleans, uh, where again, while we see some encouragement, challenges remain in that community. Uh, some uh, 837,000 N95 masks for healthcare workers. 165 surgical masks, uh, other items including uh, almost 6 million gloves have been distributed. Uh, Detroit continues to be a real focal point. We're working closely with uh, uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer as well as uh, Mayor Mike Duggan uh, to meet the needs of healthcare workers in Detroit. Just in the last five days, 1.6 million N95 masks have been routed into the healthcare system in Detroit. Uh, nearly 700,000 surgical masks and and 24 million gloves, just as a portion of what's displayed. And in the Chicago metro area, uh, which we continue to focus on each and every day, more than 1.7 million N95 masks have been routed into their healthcare system, 900,000 surgical masks, 25 million gloves. I share these details in the hopes that healthcare workers looking on will be encouraged. At the President's direction, we are. Uh, we are making every effort to make sure you have the resources you need to do your job, to do it safely, and to go home safe to your family, even while you provide that extraordinary and courageous care that our health care workers are providing literally around the clock in the midst of the coronavirus the challenge. Uh, uh, the, the last slide is just the cumulative numbers that uh, we have distributed, and I'm happy in a few moments to answer any questions about that. Again, um, the system that we have in place is, is one that is, is essentially infusing our major distribution networks with millions of items 
and then FEMA is directing on a day by day and oftentimes hour by hour basis where those resources are most needed. And we'll continue to do that as the coronavirus uh, makes its way through these communities and through communities that are very much uh, on our watch list uh, today. Uh, and uh, let me just lastly say that, um, again, I want to thank the American people for stepping up and doing your part. Um, we continue to be overwhelmed with one story after another uh, where people are doing social distancing, where people are looking after one another, uh, where they're checking in with a, a phone call to an elderly friend, a family member, to make sure they're okay. I mean, we are uh, on the front end of uh, 30 days to slow the spread. And I, I will tell you, as a, a non-scientist up here, uh, that um, I, I see glimmers of hope in the early numbers that we're seeing come out of the greater New York City area, New Jersey, even New Orleans and Detroit and Chicago, there does appear to be, as Dr. Burks will explain in more detail, there does appear to be evidence of leveling, evidence of progress. But this is exactly the time for all of us to redouble our efforts to do everything each and every one of us can, not just to protect our own health and that of our family and our loved ones, but to do our part uh, to ensure that we, that we lessen the impact of the coronavirus on America as a whole, but, but even more importantly, that we, that we lessen uh, the impact on lives by ensuring that we do our part to make sure that no one that is vulnerable uh, is unnecessarily exposed to this virus. With that, let me yield to Dr. Burks and then Seema Verma and Dr. Fauci, and we'll take all your questions. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, so hopefully you can see from this numbers that we've taken a, de a data detailed approach, really bringing the power of granular data to the supply chain and moving supplies based on really what you would call burden of disease and need. If I could just take, start out by not just going to the numbers at the beginning, but really talking to the community of health advocates to the community that works on the social determinants of disease and the communities of the historic black colleges and universities. We really need to improve messaging um, and I'm asking them to help us increase the messaging around this. We don't wanna give the impression that the African American community is more susceptible to the virus. We don't have any data that suggests that. What our data suggests is they're more susceptible to more um, difficult and severe disease and poor outcomes. And we really need to make sure that every household is aware of what it's going to take to protect the individuals in that household that have pre existing conditions. We could call on the indigenous nations, the real tribal leaders, to also be working very closely to protect the elders of their communities. We know this is more difficult in multi-generational households, and it's really going to call for really unbelievable attention to details of hand washing and protecting others from each other, particularly if you don't feel well. This is really a call to action to the communities to make sure that we get messages appropriately out there so that everyone understands what it's going to take for us all to protect one another. And we know it can be done because we can see these changes. I wanted to go through the numbers at a high level so you understand why particularly these supplies went to these areas to begin with. Um, we talk about attack rates or the cases per, per population. So in the New York um, as a state, they have seven cases per thousand. Um, this is the highest in the country in New York City itself. It's closer to um, almost twice that in New York City. Um, New Jersey is four per thousand, um, Louisiana three per thousand, Massachusetts two per thousand, Connecticut two per thousand, Michigan 1.5 per thousand. The District of Columbia and the Baltimore area now 1.5 per thousand and we're watching them very closely. Pennsylvania one per thousand but we're concerned um, about Philadelphia. What is allowing us to move supplies based on burden of disease and need is the extraordinary West Coast that has had very low numbers from Washington that was less than one per thousand, California that is less than 0.5 per thousand, and Oregon that's even less than that. And it's those states where there's large populations because of the enormous work that they're doing to prevent expansion and spread of the virus. It's allowing resources to go to these 
these states and these communities and these counties that need more support. And so this kind of data analysis is allowing us to make very intelligent decisions about need, but also really understanding what's happening across the country in the development of the curves, as you have heard about. And so we do see, and I know you heard me caution that over the weekend, sometimes there is decreased case reporting. And so there were increases in a series of communities on Monday. We're seeing that stabilize again. And when you look over three days, you're starting to see that we may be actually in a series of um, communities outside of New York and New Jersey and Connecticut, creating a much flatter graph. Um, a, most, a much flatter curve. So you saw New York and the increase, and then you saw, we're hoping, as, as Governor Cuomo and, May, and the mayor has described, that they're getting to a steady state where the next outcome is going down. But we see across the country, in Detroit, in Chicago, some real, not this extreme going to seven cases per thousand, but really staying in the more two cases per thousand and a different curve parameter then and it really shows the amazing amazing activity of every american in those cities to really ensure that there's social distancing and really importantly to ensure there's less socialization between households and really ensuring that the household really remains independent and protected and not really um, at this moment going out into the community or socializing anywhere but a virtual way on computers, by Zoom, by FaceTime. And I think we can really see that in the data. And it's really given us great heart. Um, I want to finish by really talking to my laboratory directors, because you're extraordinary and you've done an amazing amount of testing. Those nearly two million tests that we're getting to, those were all done in the last two to three weeks. But we do have S excess capacity. So if all the lab directors could look in their laboratories, if they have an, an Abbott M2000, if they could get that up and running, we could double the number of tests that we're doing per day. That is a high throughput. The machines are throughout the United States. There's hundreds of them. Right now, about 80% of them are idle. We're going to have a call with the laboratory directors of these laboratories to really ensure this is an automated, robotic um, situation that they can run. There's over a million tests sitting. Um, test kits sitting, ready to be run. We have five platforms of tests. This is one of our really high volume platforms, like Roche, and we're really calling on them to really increase that capacity so that we can do not only increased diagnostic testing, which I think we're doing quite well right now, but also increasing the ability to do more healthcare workers, first responders, community testing, and surveillance. And so, and then finally, you will see and you've heard about it happening in the UK and other places. There's a series of antibody tests out there that have not been validated. We're working right now very closely with a series of companies that know how to make these tests, that have made these tests for us for decades for HIV, for a rapid test. They're working on that technology to bring that quality of test, which is in the 90 plus percent sensitivity and specificity, to the American people for antibody tests. But before, until we get those, if you see them on the internet, do not buy them until we can give you a test that's reliable for all Americans. And we are working very hard to have that happen and bring that to the American public. Some of the tests that may be available on the internet may have very low sensitivity and specificity and give you a false reassurance that you either give you a false positive or a false negative, implying that you may be protected. So please wait until we have those tests available and validated. People are working around the clock to make those available to the American people. We all understand how important that is because you've heard us talk about asymptomatic um, cases, and we really want to know how broad that is and how common that is. And so in places like New York City, where I described that they had a seven per thousand, sometimes two, three, and four times any other place in the United States, being able to know what the number of people who never had symptoms but do have a positive test would be really critical at this point, particularly as we plan for any reoccurrence in the fall or in future um, seasons. Thank you. Great.
And uh, we at Seema Verma, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, will discuss what we've done to support hospitals. Uh, as we support health care workers, we want to make sure the institutions uh, that are providing uh, the environment for care are well financed, and she's got a couple of funding streams, and help is on the way. Seema. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. And let me just start with echoing the President and the Vice President's comments about our condolences to all the people out there that have lost somebody to the coronavirus. And also, a, you know, sincere uh, appreciation and thanks to all our health care workers that are on the front lines. But we know that it's the impact on the health care system isn't just those front care, uh, front line workers. Um, health care organizations across the nation are having increased expenses. They're having to spend more on supplies. You're seeing all of the supplies that are being sent to them, and that's having a direct impact on their on their bottom line. Um, many of them are also having increased expenses because they're taking advantage of some of the flexibilities that we've given them. Hospitals without walls, they're putting, you may see tents out in their parking lots where they're doing testing or screening. So they have a lot of increased expenses as well. Um, other healthcare organizations are not performing essential sur surgeries or other services. A lot of them are moving to telehealth, and that represents lost revenue for these um, healthcare organizations across the country. And so the president has asked us to, to address this issue about 10 days ago. Um, we put out something called accelerated payments that we do in the Medicare program, and it allows us to advance payments to providers based on their historical uh, Medicare uh, revenues that they receive. So just in, in 10 days, we've been able to provide payments uh, to providers. We had about 25,000 requests. We've processed about 70% of these. It's happened in about five days. And the total on that is about $34 billion that we've managed to put into the healthcare system. But those are essentially loans. Um, the President has asked us to go further with this and to start uh, the implementation of the CARES Act. Um, that provides $100 billion to the health care system. Um, you've heard Secretary Azar talk about the focus on some of those dollars going towards the uninsured, uh, but the President wants us to accelerate getting those dollars out. And so this week we will be putting out another $30 billion, which are grants. This is going to be based on Medicare revenue. There are no strings attached, so the health care providers that are receiving these dollars can essentially spend that um, in any way that they see fit. Um, also, this is going to be done in a very easy, simplified way for many of our health care providers. We actually do direct deposit with them, and so those dollars will just go right into their bank accounts. For other providers, all it's going to require is some very simple registration, and we'll be able to give them that money as well. So we're expecting that to happen this week. The other thing to note is that this is not a first-come, first-served basis. Because we are basing this on their Medicare revenue, they will get these dollars. Um, so even if it takes a few days, there shouldn't be any panic in the system as well. Um, the other thing to, to recognize here is that um, our priority was on getting these dollars out as quickly as possible. We heard that from the many health care providers across the country that weighed in on this. They said the most important thing was to get these dollars out as quickly as possible. But we recognize that in terms of getting these dollars out, because it's based on Medicare revenues, there are providers out there, pediatricians, children's hospitals, OBGYNs, even our nursing homes, that a lot of their revenue comes from other sources, Medicaid or other payer sources. And so those um, organizations will be addressed in the second tranche of funding and will have a, a priority um, for these organizations and these types of health care providers. Um, also just want to say, so together between the loans that we've put out there with our accelerated payments and the $30 billion, that's about $64 billion for the health care system this week alone. Um, and so I think, again, this is part of our effort to support the health care system. And, it, and also just want to, again, say thank you to all our health care providers out on the front lines. Um, to all Americans, the best thing that we can do to support our health care providers is to adhere to those guidelines around 30 days to slow the spread. That is the best thing that we can do to support our health care workers. Thank you. I just want to make a brief comment to get back to the discussion about the health disparities in, in uh, the African-American community, because it really is very important. And the reason I want to bring it up, because I couldn't help sitting there reflecting about sometimes when you're in the middle of a crisis, like we are now with the coronavirus, uh, it really does have ultimately 
shine a very bright light on some of the real weaknesses and foibles in our society. And as some of you know, I've, the greater proportion of my professional career has been defined by HIV AIDS. And if you go back then, uh, during that period of time when there was extraordinary stigma, particularly against the gay community, and it was only when the world realized how the gay community responded to this outbreak with incredible courage and dignity and, and strength and activism that I think that really changed some of the stigma against the gay community, uh, very much so. I see a similarity here because health disparities have always existed for the African American community. But here again with the crisis, how it's shining a bright light on how it's unacceptable that is. Because yet again, when you have a situation like the coronavirus, they are suffering disproportionately, as Dr. Berg said correctly. It's not that they're getting infected more often, it's that when they do get infected, their underlying medical conditions, the diabetes, the hypertension, the obesity, the asthma, those are the kind of things that wind them up in the ICU and ultimately give them a higher death rate. So when all this is over, and as we've said, it will end, we will get over coronavirus, but there will still be health disparities, which we really do need to address in the African-American community. Thanks. Well said. Questions for our uh, panel, please. Yeah, for Mr. Vice President, and then a question for Dr. Burks as well. Sure. On the ventilator issue, with 8,400 of them in the stockpile and tens of thousands more coming, why are states like California and Washington needing to send ventilators to other states? And is that smart if they might need them later on? Well, I'm going to let Dr. Burke speak about what's happening in California and Washington because it is a real credit to the people of both states and the leadership of both states to see the progress that we've made. Uh, we continue to witness that the numbers where the outbreak began, we all remember when this first emerged in the Seattle area, um, the numbers continue to be steady and low. And what we've seen uh, uh, the governor of California do what we saw the governor of uh, Washington State do and the governor of Oregon, where the, the coronavirus hasn't arrived to a large extent in Oregon, I think is in keeping with the highest tradition uh, of, uh, of the American spirit. And they are understanding what I think, I think Americans are understanding more and more that while we, we tend to think of this as one large curve in our minds for if we, when it began in our country and we long for the day that it will end and we want to hasten that day by by putting into practice all these mitigation efforts the the reality is what these experts have explained to this lay person is that what what we're actually going to witness is a number of small curves that will cumulatively mean that curve and uh, uh, for uh, for Oregon for Washington State for California to recognize where the need is and then to, to partner with us uh, and FEMA to make sure the resources are there at the time of the need, at the point of the need, I, I think is really inspiring. But Dr. Burks, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I, I want to be clear. No, we didn't ask for their ventilators. They looked at their epidemio epidemiologic curves. These are these states have amazing health commissioners, and I think when this is over, we'll really be. All of the models were based on something we have never attempted to do anywhere in the world. We have never attempted to do this kind of mitigation. It was always theoretic um, to many individuals. Um, and now we see across the globe people mitigating against this virus, realizing that their own behaviors can change the course and future of this virus in their communities, which is really astounding, the power that gives us to actually understand that we can compete against this virus and do well. And so I think their governors and their health commissioners looked at their curves, looked at their hospitals, looked at their ICU, and looked at their needs, and then decided that they didn't need those at this time and wanted to make it available for other states that were in more of that two per thousand, three per thousand, four per thousand, and seven per thousand. And I think we'll learn a lot um, from other states and other communities to really understand how to do this better next time. And I think this is what will, will teach us because we've never, we've never attempted anything like this, at least in my lifetime, where we've had, you know, these 30 days to stop the spread. I mean, we've not ever 
put out information like that. Um, so I think that I think you heard the CDC director talk earlier today about in the models how different individuals thought communities would mitigate and the rate at which they would mitigate. mitigate. And I think you can see that across the world we're learning that when you give communities the information that they need to understand what's going on and you're transparent, that communities can be part of the solution in a transparent and amazing way. And I think this kind of education and dialogue is always critical when you want communities. I think when I first started here five weeks ago, I said that we will win based on what the communities are able to do as a community of Americans. And I think we're all really deeply impressed about what they were able to do. So it's the governors who decided. The, the, the testing backlog, I just had a quick follow-up question on that. How close are we to getting into that 24-hour window you've talked about being very important? And then what is the status of the self-swap test? So we're tracking all of that very closely. I and I'm, you know, I use my time here to appeal to people specifically, the health educators, the health advocates, because I know the power with them. But to my lab directors, I really need the Abbott M2000 online, because that means we can do an extra hundred thousand tests a day, and there's enormous power in that. The self the ability to self-test, the ability, I, last time I had my test here, I self-tested. Um, so it can be done. It's straightforward. Um, it works very well with that rapid five-minute test. But what we now have to create, and I know that's always difficult because everybody wants one of something, we now have to create a mosaic that brings together where we know every single machine is in the United States, where our gaps are, and then align resources with need and gaps in the testing and ensure that we have the right laboratory test for the right community. So you can see there would be communities, particularly the Indian Health Service or rural communities, where that Abbott ID Now kit could be incredibly helpful because otherwise they're shipping it all the way to a uh, capital maybe three states away and that's going to add two or three days to the wait time which we're trying to get away right, from right. right the backlog two or three days or how what would you it varies five? state by state and we'll be talking with all of the states about really changing how we do testing in the community to really ensure that we're testing optimally um, because right now we have still focused very much on hospital diagnosis because we know it will make a difference in treatment. So these major laboratories are still putting drive-through tests at the back to all the hospital tests. And so that's where the backlog is in the drive-through tests. So I know if you're an outpatient, not an inpatient, but if you're an outpatient, that is where the delays right now are, but it's state by state. And so some states have 24 hour, 48 hours for both their outpatients and inpatients. Others have short for inpatient and longer in outpatient. And then we're trying to reconcile those right. two pieces. Right. And, and the team is actually meeting tonight to review that. But one of the data points that we review is literally on a state by state basis, what the turnaround time is. Uh, for testing, and we continue to work that. And these Abbott Laboratory devices um, are, there's 18,000 of them across the country. When you go to your doctor office and get, get a strep test, it's that device. All, all Abbott Laboratories has done with strong and swift efforts of the FDA is create a test to put in that for the coronavirus, and it's a 15-minute test. And so we, uh, I, I want to renew our, our call to all the healthcare providers around the country is, Find your Abbott device, and um, we'll work our hearts out to get a test to you. How about in the back corner? Mr. Vice President, thank you. One for you, and then one for either of the doctors, if you don't mind. Um, for you, sir, uh, back to this idea of reopening up the economy. Since it's not like there's a switch that you can just turn it back on, how does the administration envision this happening? Is it guidance from the White House, and you hope the governors follow it? Are you going to put it in the governor's hands or the mayor's hands? How do you envision all of that working together? Well, the, the one thing I can assure you is that the president's decision in that regard is going to be informed by what the data shows and, and about decisions about when we can responsibly reopen America and put America back to work. Uh, I can tell you the CDC will have new guidance uh, tomorrow. 
that the CDC will be publishing for people who uh, were in proximity uh, to an individual that tested positive for coronavirus but have no symptoms. And CDC will be publishing new guidance about how those individuals and the circumstances under which they might be able to return back to work using uh, some facial protection and monitoring their temperature, but we'll detail that for you. But um, what we're going to be doing over the weeks ahead is while we focus every day at the point of the knee, as the president said many times, our first mission is to save lives. And that means to, to slow the spread, to bend the curve, to continue to engage the American people, which they are admirably doing, to continue to put all the social distancing into practice. But there is a dual track that the president has already initiated. Uh, some of the best minds here at the White House are beginning to think about what recommendations will look like uh, that, we, that we give to businesses, that we give to states. Uh, but it'll all, I promise you, be informed on putting the health and well-being of the American people first. Dr. Burks? Either for Dr. Burks or for Dr. Fauci. Do either of you want to take that? Or? Go ahead. Yes. Secondly, um, as a lot of parents are sitting home uh, with their kids, and they've been home with their kids for weeks now, and they're wondering, maybe resigned to the fact that maybe their kids aren't going back to school this year, but are looking ahead, what do you think summer camp holds, and what do you think the start of next school year holds? If you could look down the line. Do you think those start on time? Do you think school next year starts on time? Can I say a word on behalf of teachers since I'm married to one? <laughs> there you go. My wife was all day yesterday at the elementary school she teaches at, loading up about 500 bins of art supplies for kids. And she's just one of millions of teachers across this country who, who find themselves having to distance teach kids. And uh, I'm proud of Karen, but relatedly, I'm proud of every teacher in this country. Uh, the Secretary of Education was here not long ago talking about our efforts to expand distance learning resources, even in K through 12. To all the teachers who are out there, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you're doing, for continuing learning, even in this challenging time. Uh, and uh, to all of the kids, uh, just because you're home doesn't mean you don't have to do your schoolwork. Uh, keep it up. What I will tell you is I'll, I'll yield to the health experts, but that'll be part of what we're looking at in terms of, of guidance going forward, whether it, whether it be summer school, uh, or whether it be returning to school next fall. But the most important thing we can do is put this epidemic behind us as quickly as possible. Well, my daughter is a school teacher, so she asked me the same, the same question. Um, you know, it, it is unpredictable, but you can get a feel for if we start talking about the things where the curve goes down and we really have minimal. Um, how we respond and what kind of a rebound we see or don't see, I think is going to have a lot of influence probably more immediately on things like summer camps than it does in the fall. I fully expect, though I'm humble enough to know that I can't accurately predict, that by the time we get to the fall that we will have this under control enough that it certainly will not be the way it is now where people are shutting schools. My optimistic side tells me that we'll be able to renew to a certain extent, but it's going to be different, remember now, because this is not going to disappear. So we're going to have to have in place the capability of doing the things that we talk about all the time on this stage, to identify, to isolate, to contact trace, number one. Number two, by that time, we'll have a better feel with the antibody test about what the actual penetrance of this infection was in society. How many people have actually been infected? Who's protected? If you have antibody, it's very likely that you're protected. Who's vulnerable? Do you treat vulnerables different than you treat the people who are protected? All of these things are going to go into the decision of just how much back to the original way we'd like it to be in the fall. Bottom line is no absolute prediction, but I think we're going to be in good shape. Dr. Fauci? Thanks much for Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burks. Um, uh, can you talk about your concerns about deaths being misreported uh, by coronavirus because of either uh, testing yeah, or standards for how they're characterized? 
So I think in this country, we've taken a very liberal approach to mortality. And I think the reporting here has been pretty straightforward over the last five to six weeks. Prior to that, when there wasn't testing in January and February, that's a very different situation um, and unknown. There are other countries that if you had a pre-existing condition, and let's say the virus called you to go to the ICU and then have a heart or kidney problem, some countries are recording that as a heart issue or a kidney issue and not a COVID-19 death. Um, right now, we're still recording it and we'll, I mean, the great thing about having forms that come in and a form that has the ability to mark it as COVID-19 infection, the intent is right now that those, if someone dies with COVID-19, we are counting that as a COVID-19 death. Are you, can you be sure? I mean, you hear from coroners that that's not necessarily the case. Are, are you sure? How can you be confident about that? And is there any concern that it skews the data that you're trying to collect in terms of projections and, and things like that? Well, I think that would apply more to rural areas that may not have the same level of testing. But I, I, I am pretty confident in New York City yeah. and in New Jersey and places that have these large outbreaks and COVID-only hospitals. I can tell you they are testing. Um, New York and New Jersey together have, uh, by proportion, are testing extraordinary well as Washington State and Louisiana. So I don't see that there's been a barrier in testing to diagnosis. No, I, I, I think there's so much focus now on coronavirus that, particularly if you take New York, which we all know is, is, is having a disproportionately higher proportion of the burden of the entire country is right now in, in New York. You know, I can't imagine if someone comes in with coronavirus, goes to an ICU, and they have an underlying heart condition and they die, they're going to say cause of death heart attack. <laughs> I, I cannot see that that happening. So I don't think it's going to be a problem. How about, how about one more? Um, a question for Dr. Fauci on uh, the virus hitting black communities the hardest. I mean, these numbers are staggering. Louisiana and other states are reporting 40 to 70 percent of deaths are African Americans. Do you expect that pattern to continue nationwide? Some states have not even reported their data yet. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't be confident to, to predict patterns, but the underlying reason why that is happening doesn't change from state to state. So you expect it to get worse? No, I, I expect that when African Americans get infected, given the disproportionate disparity of the underlying conditions that lead to complications like the ones I mentioned, I expect that we will still see the pattern that when you look at the proportion of people who get into serious trouble and die, again, it's going to be disproportionate towards the African Americans. I do expect that. And is the federal government now leading the charge in collecting this information yes. from the states? And when will it be made public? Yes. Yes. yes, the answer is yes. It will be public as soon as you get enough data to be able to make a meaningful statement. So can we expect this week or a couple of days? Uh, the task force has assigned that to several um, uh, members of the team. We're assembling that data now. It's a, it, it, is a, uh, uh, it is a great concern. Uh, for us, and um, um, but it's it's probably a, a, a good reminder that um, we have to be especially careful around people with serious underlying health conditions. As we've said it many times from this podium over many weeks, that the risk of serious illness from the coronavirus remains low for the average American, but for anyone from any community that has a serious underlying health condition, particularly senior citizens with serious underlying health conditions, the risk of, of, um, of, of tragedy is very real. And so uh, we're, we're gonna be very diligent about studying this and providing information and guidance in accordance with uh, our best scientists. Uh, but I, I do wanna say to each and every American, the President's coronavirus guidelines for America about wash your hands. Uh, if, you're, if you're sick, stay home. If you can work from home, if you're not in critical infrastructure like uh, our incredible health care workers or all those heroic people working to keep food on the shelves at our grocery stores and keep medicine at the pharmacies, we, 
We ask you to we ask you to work from home if you can. Avoid unnecessary travel. Avoid gatherings of more than 10 people. Um, uh, use a drive-through at a restaurant. Uh, don't go in the restaurant. Not just to protect your health, but to protect those uh, of every community, of every background in this country who may have underlying conditions that make them susceptible to tragic outcomes. Uh, that's how we can all do our part to slow the spread and to protect our most vulnerable. And uh, the American people are doing it. And as we continue to do that, we will hasten the day that we put the coronavirus in the past and we reopen America and put America back to work. Thank you all. We'll see you tomorrow.